My guest today is Walt Richer. Walt, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, thanks for coming to my hometown of oh, Chicago, yeah. Illinois. It's nice here. The weather's awesome. It's always like this in mid-October. It's always to... like 70 degrees. Yeah, is it? <laughs> yeah. It's warmer. That's why it's, Illinois is called the Sunshine State. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> I know that's because I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> I heard once you're not supposed to talk about the weather on podcasts. Uh, where'd you hear that? You. You told me like five <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, not a, don't talk excessively about okay. the weather, I think was my point. Uh, what's um, what should we talk about? I think we were going to talk about Tri.net, which is the thing oh, I yeah, worked on. Oh yeah, you mentioned on. that yesterday, and uh, I I don't know what that is. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people do. It's relatively new. It was uh, announced at uh, the .NET Conf a couple okay, weeks ago. Okay, that was the online conference. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that, that and I missed. <laughs> yeah, so the, I, have you, you haven't heard of it. So I, I've spoken at dot dot com. No, I mean you haven't heard of try dot net. That's something I have not until you mentioned it yesterday. Uh, yeah. So the idea is, it's a it's a tool that Microsoft's building for document documentation and uh, authors, people that mm -hmm. write documentation, and especially if you write documentation that has code samples in it. Hmm. Right. So, so this you, is particularly for uh, technical documentation. Yes. So you know that when you read technical documentation, a lot of times there'll be a code block, and you'll read a little bit of instruction, mm -hmm. and then there'll be, here's a bit of code that illustrates the point I want to talk about. Uh -huh. Well, you know, the problem with that is it's static code. You're reading it, and if you actually want to try it, you have to copy and paste it into yeah. your whatever app. The, the revolutionary thing was the button that says copy. Yes. It's copied to your clipboard, which, right. I, which really impressed me when it came out. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you'll be really impressed with try it on it. sounds then. better. So the idea, so you've got the static text. Well, n if you look in a lot of the interpreted languages like JavaScript, there's all sorts of websites out there that let you run the JavaScript in oh, yeah, the yeah. site. Like so you go learn jQuery, they have a lot of those Yeah, or you can go things. to CodePen, and the people will up upload their samples there, mm -hmm. and then it'll run right in the browser. That's and nice. Or you can, a lot of those, you can modify the code so you can see the person's code and make a few tweaks on it and rerun the application. Oh, nice. And that seems relatively simple because the browser itself supports JavaScript. Right. And since it's an interpreted language, you know, when you when you make a change, it's just going to get reinterpreted. Right. The, if you want to do the same thing with C sharp code, now C sharp code is compiled. Right. right. So we go through this compile step, and then what if? So if you want to have an interactive code editor for C sharp, how do you deal with in the browser somebody making a one line, you know, one yeah, word change in your code? That, save it somewhere. Run that. Yeah, compile you have to compile code. it, and you have to. Where do you put the the executable. Right. So the idea behind Try.net is let's do th that with live code for C Sharp. Mm -hmm. So you move, you could still have your code, your static code on the page, and you could still copy it, but there'd be an editor right next to it, and you could paste it in there. Or if you want, the person that's writing the documentation site could, let's say as you move through the doc, it could automatically load the code samples into the code editor. Oh, nice. So as you scroll up and down, it can right. load them, or there could be a button right next to it, like the one you liked. <laughs> Instead of saying copy, uh -huh. it could say oh, oh, add to uh, live editor. Oh, nice. Right? And so that's what try.net is. And I believe uh, right now it's written in Blazor. Mm -hmm. and okay. so I've been hearing a lot about Blazor. Uh, yes, I bet you have. Uh, so that is a benefit of Blazor is that it lets you run a binary in the browser. Hmm. So if you, if you can compile code to the um, WebAssembly specification, mm -hmm. then you can load that into the browser, and the browser can run it natively. It's going to be fast. And so what I think Microsoft's done, I don't know because I haven't seen the code, but I'm, what I suspect is they've done is that when you write your code, and, and put it in the editor, mm -hmm. and then you click the run button, it's running the Optus WebAssembly. And then if you edit it, right, they just recompile it mm -hmm. back into the WebAssembly and then run it again. Interesting. Uh, so does this only work with .NET code? Yes. Okay. And it has C Sharp or VB or F Sharp? Or? So far, it's only C Sharp. There's okay. plans for both F Sharp. I think there's plans for VB, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also only works with .NET Core 3. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So what I, I did a course on this for LinkedIn Learning ah. uh, that was uh, released uh, at the same time as the .NET Conf. Okay. Well, yeah. What's the name of the course? It's uh, tried, uh, something like learning try.net. Okay. It's a 30-minute course. And it's a, what I talk about in that course is 
how do you, if you're the document creator, the person that's writing the documentation, well, how do you do this? It's, it's pretty easy to understand how to use it. As, from a user perspective, you type some code in, you press the run button. If the code doesn't compile, you're going to get an error in the browser. Right. But how do you, as the document person, the person that's writing I the... I want to build that into my documentation. Yeah. So you get a list of code and a bunch of text that you're supposed to put on the page. Okay. How do you take that code and make it show up in the editor? How do you? Yeah, you... Uh, it's pretty easy, actually. You um, you have to install a couple pieces of software on your computer mm -hmm. um, from the try.net team. Okay. And one of them is the runtime that lets you try it out on your developer computer without mm -hmm. having to create a website. Okay. And then one of them is also a set of templates. So you can start with a pre-built try.net uh, project. So you can see what it should, what it looks like. In a yeah, so it's like a hello world for try.net, yeah. okay. right? So you say create new project, and then it just does the thing. But basically, the basic thing is... The, what editor do, you, editor do you use, or does it matter? You can use uh, VS Code or okay. Visual Studio. It's just text that we're going to be... Editing. It's just a text file, right? Okay. So if you want to use a text editor, that would work too. Mm -hmm. And so there's two parts to make it work. There's a, there's a, markup do, a markdown document. Mm -hmm. That's, That's the, where you write your documentation. Right. Okay. So you write the text, the explainer, you know, any images that you want, and then a chunk of code, mm -hmm. okay, static code. And then you also write that real that same code in a real application. It could be a console application or whatever type of app you want, and you make sure that works and compiles. And then you go in and you mark. There's two things you have to do. You mark your code with basically a beginning and ending block. You use a region. Mm -hmm. You put in a region. You say, this is the section of code that I want to show. Regions in the are back. They I are. I haven't used them for years. Yeah. This is one good use of them, I yeah. think. I know a lot of developers don't like them. Uh, people abuse them, I think. Yes. Kind of like the people that talk about the weather for too long. <laughs> <laughs> so you have... You basically put a region here saying, this is the start of where I want the code to appear, and here's the region end region where I want the code to end. Now, you can have more code in front of that and okay. behind it, you like, if set up like setup up. that you don't want to show because it's not important for that demo. Uh, okay, I see. Right? But it still gets run. It still gets run every time they execute the, right. the block invisibly behind the scenes. Right. The wizard runs the... Right, so you're setting up a connection to a database or whatever yeah. other things you need to do that can be done in the hidden code. Got it. So you put the... Uh, what does it say? You put regions around that, okay? Then over in your markdown file, uh -huh. you take your what normally looks like a static section of code, okay. and you, you use what's called a code fence. So that's typically how you mark down how you tags? do tags. Uh, it's like three backticks. Oh, yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, so you put three backticks in, and then you put the language that you're going to show, so it knows how to yep. do I did, it. I didn't know that had a name. What is it called? The, the three code, code fence. Code fence. I didn't yes. know that was called. Yeah. Okay, but I have uh, used that. <laughs> and then it's like you do tick 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 CS. Yep. And that means for C sharp. Okay. Okay. And normally that would just show a block of text in the browser. Yeah, and it, I think it does some formatting, so it right. looks it looks like C sharp. C sharp or F sharp or whatever. So that works. And then what you do is there's some extra parameters now that you pass in on the code fence. Hmm. So instead of saying tick 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 CS. It has several other parameters. One of them is point to the assembly for the where's the project project you screen. Yeah, where's the and what's the name of the? You can probably figure this out. What's the name of the, what, the executable? The uh, we need the ex we need to know the class that it's in. Oh, okay. And you also need to know the name of the the uh, region. Region. What did you tell the region? Because you could have more than one region in the same uh, okay. block of code. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. So I could have three regions, and I show, show each one, one is here different. One down exactly. Down there, yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That's really that's, all it is. is so you do your markdown, you do your code, make sure your code works, you tell it where to find the code, and then you, of course, publish it eventually to the web. Okay, so you're going to publish the markdown, and you're going to publish uh, maybe a folder with, uh, right. with all your binaries. Right. And, and I, don't know, I don't know how it works, because I haven't actually gone through the deployment process, because mm -hmm. one of the other cool things that Microsoft did is they built this testing harness. Mm -hmm. So you just, I usually just go out to PowerShell, and I say, uh, .NET, uh, I'm sorry, not .NET, um, try .NET, mm -hmm. and you tell it to basically uh, test your code, make sure it's valid. Uh -huh. So it'll make sure you've got all the code fences you need, and it can find the assemblies, and mm -hmm. the code builds, everything, and it'll give you a status, yes or no, is this, does this work? And then you can say run, and then it spins up a browser and loads the binary and everything in for you already. So okay. I don't, you don't have to understand the, the deployment process just to get up and running. Right. Uh, one thing about this that uh, makes me a little bit nervous is that C Sharp is a much more powerful language than JavaScript, and so you could potentially write code that does some harm. 
How is that? Are we protected against that? I don't know the answer to that. So you're like saying, could we somehow ex basically ex well, isn't know. the WASM, the uh, web assembly is running in a sandbox. Oh, so that's what protects you from anything outside of the browser. Yeah. I thought you were going in a different place with this question, which is uh, .NET can do so much. I mean, there's a bazillion kinds of projects you can create. Mm -hmm. Can you do like a UI type application? In oh, could you do open a win form, I guess. Right. Or, you know, d um, what if I did ASP.NET Core app and could I run that in... Uh, uh, could I build the assembly using that and then just show a code part? And I don't know if that's true, but I have tried it with other non console All the, the demos I did for my course were all console applications. It makes a lot of sense. It's simple and you don't want to, it's really the simplest type of application. Right, but on the other hand, think about it if you're doing, what if you're doing, uh, if you're the ASP.NET team and you want to show how to do the C sharp code that's specific to a controller or something like that? Well, you still need a controller, right? That's true. Uh, or what if, um, what was I just thinking? What's that? Your next course. <laughs> Could be. Could be. I had another, uh, well, I was going somewhere else, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. So now, now, how do I get this? Is this something I, I download, or is it a uh, is it part of Visual Studio? Yeah, all you do is go just search for try it's T R Y mm -hmm. uh, dot N E T. One word, try N E T, and that's um, dot, try dot net. Try dot net. Yeah. Okay. And if you go there, there's some documentation that tells you how to get started, what what the three or four things you need to install. Okay, so things I need to install locally on my computer right. that even I probably would need dot net core of course right. as well. Is this dot uh, uh, net core three? Mm -hmm. Only .NET Core 3? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, where are you speaking next? I'm speaking here. At Tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm in Chicago. I'm at uh, VS Live. Okay. So I just did a talk. By the time they see this, this will, I just that did will a talk. have already happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, by the time this airs. Yeah. And I'm doing some talks tomorrow on, it's all UI stuff. I'm talking about um, one of the new, other new things I think is pretty cool that's, that's interesting from a programmer's perspective, but it's not really programming is the new power apps mm -hmm. I guess I'm have you done anything with that I have done with power apps my son actually had a job where he was doing a lot of power apps oh yeah and so I was trying to How help him out uh, it was okay um, power apps are uh, really nice if you have something simple to do you can get up and running in a hurry I mean we've got like what does it I forget the name all the technology we have to do this but is it info forms or something like that in, you know, info path, info path did, uh, similar to that only, only a little more powerful than that um, but when you start to get really complex, then it's probably my feeling is that maybe we should move away from Power Apps and build an actual application in a I agree robust with that. framework. I agree with and that. So but his employer was having him do really robust things. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the the target audience for Power Apps is something Microsoft. I don't know if they coined this term, but I just heard it last year called citizen developers. Mm -hmm. So it's the business yeah. it's the business stakeholder at the company that doesn't have no programming skills, but yeah. they're also a wizard at Excel and they, they're really competent, but they're not programmers. Right. And so they're building power apps and Microsoft Flow and yeah. and Power BI and things like that to kind of tap into this market. Because there's, there's what, 750 million Excel users out there? Yeah, and, and that's, that's great. And it's, it tells the same way, great tool for what it does, but people try sometimes to build run build an entire line of business application on top of it, and that's where it starts. I to think that's a failure. Mm -hmm. And I think power apps I've seen it, it seemed that they, you could you could follow that trap as well. I think so. But I, 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 I do like, like it. I had the the program manager for both power apps and for Flow on my show okay. at about that same time two years ago. Okay, when they were first released. I think my point when I, in the talk is that. Developers are sometimes in that same position. It's like where you need it. Just, it's really good at doing uh, forms over data. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's, how many times have you needed a, a little app for your team yeah. and it's not in your official timeline? You don't have time to build now it. You've got you fire could, up Visual Studio, file right. a new project, deploy it somewhere. Right. No, and with power apps. With power sure. apps, I could build a forms over data in a couple, an hour maybe yeah. or less. I, I demo one in, you know, in just a couple minutes. Right. And so totally. I, I, it's but just another great. tool in your tool belt that yeah. can solve a problem. I, I, totally, I think we're in violent agreement on this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we're done. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. One of my favorite things to do is go to conferences where I can get as much technology as I can and meet with the friends that I only see at conferences.